fast, sleek, and sexy. They're built to quietly maneuver in the shadows of covert operations or to wow audiences on the big screen. Theirs is a realm that lies between fact and fiction, where the imaginations of gadget masters can literally save the world. The Gadgets of James Bond, next on Modern Marvels. To be a good spy requires courage, daring, and the best toys technology can offer. So it's no surprise the world of spy masters is the fodder for filmmakers. Real life spy gadgets often inspire the bewildering array of props and gizmos created by magicians of the movies, a celluloid version of art imitating life. Gadgets are so important. Every preview I've been to, everybody I've talked to, I'm going to say, oh, what gadgets have you got this time? Everybody is madly interested in gadgets. The audience love them. There was one film where we got a real audience response that they really wanted more gadgets. And so it's something we take into consideration hugely when we're embarking on a film that we've, we've got to do these gadgets, you know, to keep them happy, because they just love it. And we love it as well. <laughs> Conversely, gadgets found in films often wind up being the genesis behind real-world spy technology. This briefcase, basically, is the same theme as from Russia with Love. Spy toys can be divided into several categories. Cars, boats, guns, covert spy tools, and flying machines. One of the best-known spy gadgets used in films and television shows was the Bell Textron rocket belt. The belt and later versions of the flying machine are thrust-driven devices that can literally make a person fly. I think if I had to pick a favorite thing that is believable, that I would love to have, I think it's the rocket pack on the back. I think that was a wonderful, wonderful gadget because it was real, it was futuristic and unbelievable. You look at it and you think, wow, is that on wires? And you actually realize it's for real. I think that was very innovative in its day. I think it was fantastic. Wendell Moore, a Bell aerospace engineer in Buffalo, New York, created the belt in the late 1950s and early 1960s. Moore got the idea while working with liquid hydrogen peroxide used in the rocket boosters of high-flying research aircraft to keep them stable at stratospheric altitudes. The first tests of the belt were done with pilots tethered to lines inside an airplane hangar. By converting the liquid to a gas, a tremendous amount of thrust was created. Enough thrust, Moore realized, to launch a man into the air. By 1962, Moore perfected the belt. He made tanks that could hold up to 50 pounds of fuel. He created easy to use pitch and yaw controls on the handles of the belt. He installed a warning system inside the helmet to let a pilot know his fuel was running low. Moore's belt allowed a man to fly for up to 20 seconds at 60 miles per hour and land safely. Hugh Neeson worked with Moore on the project. Turns out it was all a very natural sequence. If you turn this left hand, you rotate it. If you turn this hand, you went up higher. If you push both back, you went forward. If you lift it up, you slow down. So it turned out to be elegantly simple. In fact, I think the early criteria was have people who weren't pilots fly it. The original thought was to supply this to the Army, to ordinary troops, far out vision, if you will. And they did not want to constrain by saying it was so complex that you had to have a pilot. 
1963, Bill Souter was a 19-year-old neighbor of William Moore's who was looking for a summer job. What he got was work as one of the first pilots to strap on the rocket belt. The second day that I showed up, I was given a low-pressure tryout on the tether. And when they keep the uh, fuel pressure low, there's not enough power to get you off the ground, but it will shove you around so you get a feel for what you're doing. And the first couple of attempts in the hangar are with low pressure, so you can feel the reaction and what you have to do to overcome it. But then when you get full pressure and your feet leave the ground, everything you, you thought about previously is gone. It's... Uh, as soon as your feet are off the ground and you're riding on that thing, it's uh, entirely different from anything you ever experienced. Suda went on to become an expert belt pilot. He flew at demonstrations all over the world and was even hired to fly in the James Bond film, Thunderball. I'm one lucky son of a gun. I was lucky that Wendell hired me and I was lucky I made it to all those 40-some foreign countries and all over the world, uh, met some incredible people. It was an experience of a lifetime, I guess, you know, that went on for 30-some years. At a private airfield outside of Dallas, Texas, today's version of James Bond's rocket belt takes to the skies. A company called Powerhouse Productions owns the belt the only one in existence that still flies. Powerhouse owner Kenny Gibson has flown the belt hundreds of times in exhibitions all over the world, from television shows to the Super Bowl. I flew several years ago at the Super Bowl, and when I landed, you would have thought I just made the winning touchdown at the Super Bowl. I mean, the people came out of their seat, they threw their arms up, and it was just this big roar. When you get face to face with them to talk about it, they're just amazed that a man can fly this way. Even though that this has been around for 35 years, they're still amazed that this thing flies in the capacity that it flies in. In all his flights, which can reach up to 200 feet off the ground, Gibson said one question is asked more than all the others combined. What does it feel like to fly? The best thing I can come up with is it, it's like you would imagine flying on a magic carpet. You're just cruising around really smooth and just making turns very graceful and very easy. After two decades of flying the belt throughout the world at venues big and small, Kinney has retired. But at the powerhouse field today, pilot Eric Scott will demonstrate how the belt works. In the business of stunt flying, Scott is known as the Rocket Man. The ground team makes some final adjustments to the belt. Then it's time for the Rocket Man to take a test flight. Scott slowly lifts off the ground and hovers for 10 seconds. Everything with the belt appears to be working fine. After refueling, Scott is ready to take to the skies. Scott flies above a nearby tree line. He makes a circle in the sky. and lands at the same spot from where he took off. <laughs> I was just having a little fun up there. <laughs> I didn't see it. Oh, that's kind of fun. <laughs> yeah, it was smooth. It was nice. Thanks, Good job. <laughs> What's the time? Thanks, everybody. Hey, good job. <laughs> I love you guys. 28 seconds. Beautiful. 28. Flight. Beautiful. Perfect. Even though they've seen it hundreds of times, every flight for the powerhouse crew is still special. You can't explain the feeling. It's like a dream that's reality. It's just one of those wonderful, hard to explain feelings that everybody probably wishes they could have the opportunity to do. When 
we continue, an eccentric English inventor creates a bizarre flying machine and amazes moviegoers like never before. To operate his gadgets, the character of 007 was required to master firearms, knife throwing, high speed driving, scuba diving, rock climbing, and martial arts. James Bond gadgets will return in a moment on Modern Marvels. We now return to James Bond gadgets on Modern Marvels. Two hours north of London, in a rolling green field just outside his country manor, 85-year-old Ken Wallace prepares to defy gravity. The retired British aviator and inventor is at the controls of his most famous creation. Though it looks like a helicopter, it's actually called an autogyro and flies like an airplane. Its rear rotor creates the thrust needed to stay aloft. used to ride motorbikes on full northern lots of times. I love speedboat racing. I've loved flying and aeroplanes. But I love these things more than any other because there's no such precise way of going flying that I know. And you get the feeling of flying, especially if, when you're up in the open, you can feel the wind and so on. It really is, in my opinion, the best way of all to go flying. In 1967, Wallace flew an autogyro named Little Nelly in the James Bond film You Only Live Twice. The gadget was a flying fantasy. It wowed audiences and made Wallace and Little Nelly famous throughout the world. It's entirely chance the way it came about. Little Nelly was the chorus girl that became the star. <laughs> Since 1961, Wallace has built 19 autogyros, each with their own strength and flight characteristics. Well, we're in the politely called hangar, with, where I have 19 autogyros of my design, of, of which 18 would literally fire up and fly straight away, including, of course, little Nelly. How an autogyro flies is based on simple science. Wallace describes it as two sycamore seeds working in unison to stay aloft. We all know that a sycamore seed is a little winged seed and when it falls from the tree it whirls around and it falls much more slowly than if it were, didn't have that little wing on. Now, the autogyro I'm flying is in effect like a pair of sycamore seeds joined together at, at the root. When you have an engine and a propeller and push it along, if you set the angle of the rotors so that they're tilted up at the front, you can actually stay up and climb. It's quite an incredible thing that it works as well as it does, and it feels so right when you're flying it. Wallace has invented all kinds of gadgets in the past 50 years, but it is the autogyro that brings him the most joy. I first flew my own design entirely in 1961, and I've got a heck of a lot of confidence in, in them since then. All the machines in my shed are basically the same design, but they're quite different in nature because of the nature of the engine that's used. Some are two-seaters, some are single-seaters. There's one fully enclosed single-seater with a 130 horsepower Rolls-Royce engine, but I must confess I like the open ones rather than the fully enclosed ones. He says the aircraft is the ultimate spy toy because it is small, lightweight, relatively quiet, and can fly over an enemy undetected. If you need a helicopter, you've got to have a helicopter. But if you want to fly low and slow and not disturb the ground, or, or you can fly very low over crops, searching for people and that sort of thing, and not do a scrap of damage below. Though autogyros are lightweight and small compared to conventional aircraft, Wallace said they're very safe. In the 40 years Wallace has been flying autogyros, he's had only a handful of engine problems because the aircraft always flies in auto rotation, the same dynamic used by helicopter pilots if their engines fail. 
Wallace has always landed safely. I think it's one of the safest aircraft that should be to, to fly, actually. I, I completely believe in them, which is why I've spent so many years on them and so many variations. I fly them at night. I fly them with infrared line scan on board, transmitting to the ground all the time in military trials and exercises. All weather has a landing light on it, land it with its own landing light at night. And, of course, it can taxi on the ground, taxi through the woods into a critical point or something, whereas a helicopter has to stand outside the woods. So it's a, it's a thoroughly practical aircraft. Little Nelly, Wallace's most famous autogyro, has done duty in films and television shows. To make the aircraft more menacing, movie makers have outfitted Little Nelly with a battery of rockets and machine guns, some of which actually fire. And though Wallace is proud of his autogyro's work in the entertainment field, its true accomplishments came closer to the spy game. The British military and several police agencies have put a Wallace autogyro to good use, either spying on enemy troops or helping solve crimes. This one is a, a, a prototype I made with a fully enclosed cockpit shape. It has a 130 horsepower Rolls-Royce aero engine in it. It's the second prototype engine that they made. But it also has a pack of four aerial cameras. And they were first of all used for coastal ecology research. But then it led, that led to the detection of buried bodies as of murder victims for the police. I did over 350 flights on test work detecting where bodies were buried. Besides finding bodies, British military has used an autogyro in the skies over Europe to assist in everything from troop reconnaissance to NATO training exercises. It was all very real, and in fact the sister of little Nelly has been updated and back in military colours, and she's taken part in aerial quick deployment exercises and out in NATO bases in Bavaria and the Lake Constance Battle Area. So little Nelly may have been a gimmick for the film, but she's also for real. Coming up, a high-powered speedboat built in Europe for the movies makes a splash in an Illinois river. In the late 1970s, a Scottish exploration team fitted a Ken Wallace autogyro with infrared cameras. They used the aircraft in an unsuccessful search for the Loch Ness Monster. James Bond gadgets will return in a moment on Modern Marvels. Inside an unassuming steel shed in the middle of an Illinois cornfield is parked one of the most remarkable water-going spy toys ever created. The Q-boat, and the world is not enough. The boat is a prized possession of the Ian Fleming Foundation and its vice president, Doug Redanius, a lifelong Bond enthusiast. Redanius has agreed to take the boat to the nearby Kankakee River to demonstrate its power. It's only the second time the Q-boat, named after its on-screen inventor, has been in the water since it was used in the 1999 film. One of the interesting things about transporting the Q-boat is it's very difficult to cover. We haven't had a cover made specifically for it because it's an odd shape. So that tends to lead to transporting it exposed to the elements, which means Many times I'll look in the rear view mirror and all of a sudden have a caravan of people who recognize the boat. They'll follow you into a rest area or to a, a filling station and want to take photographs. So a journey of 25 miles pulling a cue boat can take hours because people want to get their picture taken with it. It's, it's very recognizable. Though boats are a common sight on this section of the river, no one here has ever seen anything like the cue boat being launched. The boat that we have is uh, the stunt version of the boat. It does have what's called a complete Q dashboard in it. So you're going to see all the elaborate buttons and displays. It looks like the cockpit of the space shuttle. An onboard computer 
monitors the boat's propulsion system. In the film, the computer was programmed to control the craft's vast array of weapons. In the waters of the Kankakee River, the boat easily reaches speeds over 80 miles an hour. The Q-boat actually has a 350 horsepower Chevrolet V8 engine in it, and it has a very simple 14-foot aluminum hull. The upper deck, all the special effects, the shrouding and everything is all fiberglass, so there's not much weight for a boat with 350 horsepower. It's gas pedal fed, so you drive it like a car. The only thing is, there's no brake pedal. You have to be constantly monitoring the forward and reverse. But as anyone knows, on the water, 25, 30 miles an hour is very fast. This boat is capable of going three times that fast. So it actually becomes quite scary when you drive this boat on the water. The boat was built half a world away at London's Pinewood Studios. Under the supervision of Eon Productions Art Department and Special Effects Coordinator Chris Corbold. The gadgets on it were constructed here. We put in missiles, uh, there originally were guns in it which, was, which were never shown in the film. Um, the jets that were coming out the back, we built versions that went across the land, you know, for where it, it cut, took the shortcut. It was quite a mean boat, actually. It, was, uh, it could certainly leave your hair standing on end. The waters in this part of the river are very shallow, only six inches deep in some places. But because of the way the Q-boat was constructed, with its interior engine and small hull, it can easily move in extremely shallow depths. Besides the Q-boat, the archive section of Doug Redanius's Ian Fleming Foundation has collected a dozen other vehicles from the Bond films. There's the Glastron Speedboat from the 1979 film Moonraker, dubbed the Aston Martin of the waves because it had an escape parasail torpedo system and mine deployment. There's the submarine from 1981's For Your Eyes Only and the Parahawk flying snowmobiles from The World Is Not Enough. But it's the collection inside Rodinius's home that is most stunning. He has one of the world's most extensive ensembles of spy toys and several Bond gadgets on display. This is the wrist dart gun from the 1979 James Bond film Moonraker. It's supposedly activated by nerve impulse from one's nerves in the inside of their uh, wrist. James Bond uses this in the office when he's given it by the cue master and he shoots a dart unknowingly into a priceless painting. So it's one of those gadgets that you have to be very careful how you use it so you don't shoot the person you're shaking hands with. This item is a limpet mine. It's magnetic. Once it's activated and is attached to its intended target, one has only a few moments to get away before it explodes. This is a rebreather from Thunderball from the 1965 James Bond film. It was used by 007 to escape from a shark tank he was thrown into a swimming pool, which was capped off with a roof. He couldn't get out. So he reached in his pocket, took it out, stuck it in his mouth, and wanted the audience to believe that he could survive. Unfortunately, it didn't work. But uh, various military organizations around the country were fooled. I was uh, sitting in the office one day, and uh, the phone went, and uh, it was a gentleman from the Royal Engineers or something like that and he said uh, could you tell me anything about the under the miniaturized underwater breathing apparatus so I said yeah I'm quite au fait with it so he said what we'd really like to know how long could you stay underwater with it so I said as long as you could hold your breath and I can imagine this poor fellow going absolutely white he said what do you mean I said it's it's a cod up but he said Bond was underwater for about three or four minutes I said yeah but that is the expertise of the editor when we continue, 
a weapons-laden version of a classic English sports car, becomes known as the ultimate spy toy. During the making of The World Is Not Enough, filmmakers discovered by accident that the Q-boat had so much power that its engines could literally force the bow of the boat under the water. The move was written into the film. James Bond gadgets will return in a moment on Modern Marvels. The cars used in spy movies have always captivated audiences. They're fast, they're sexy, and they're loaded with the most outrageous gadgets filmmakers can think of. Ask any Bond fan what the greatest gadget from the films are, and the answer is almost universal. The Aston Martin DB5, the James Bond car from Goldfinger. People just blew their minds when they saw this vehicle, so much so that today people acknowledge it as the most famous car in the world. And anybody on the streets will see a silver birch Aston Martin and they'll say straight away, God, James Bond's car. For Rocky Santiago, seeing the movie as a teenager would plant the seeds of a lifelong love of the Aston Martin. It took him 21 years to find one. Now he owns a pristine 1965 model of the car, though his is red, not silver. Well, my introduction to Bond was the movie Goldfinger. I was in high school, and that's an impressionable age, and when you saw Sean Connery driving around in his DB5, it left uh, an unforgettable memory. Out on the road, Santiago says the car is an immediate attention grabber. You can go to any car show anywhere on the planet and people that maybe wouldn't have given you the time of day all of a sudden are interested in you because you own and drive a DB5. And I know it sounds weird, but it's true because it's happened to me over and over again. I think the car is special. I think people that uh, don't even like sports cars know what they are. They always refer to them as that's the type of car that Bond drives. The vehicles of James Bond are some of the most famous in the world. But outside the confines of the silver screen, they're almost never seen in public. From April to December 2001, Bond fans had a chance to see half a dozen of the actual movie cars, which are kept in the archives collection of Eon Productions, producers of the Bond films. It happened two hours south of London at England's National Motor Museum at Bewley. Margaret Rolls is an administrator with the museum. On a recent tour of the display, she noted in typical British understatement that it was a shame that a $225,000 BMW Z8 was sawed in half during the filming of The World Is Not Enough. Yes, a bit of a disaster. I wouldn't want it to happen to mine. And what a shame to do this to such a pretty vehicle. It was uh, used in a very spectacular stunt in the film, and it was literally cut in half by these five giant circular saws that were suspended from a helicopter. Some serious damage, but of course, Bond survived. You can imagine BMW when we went to their the development factory in Munich. The, the Z8 was there as the new car, you know, and uh, they pulled back the covers and there was this black beast there, you know, with red upholstery, and uh, we all went over and walked around and touched it. And, of course, you can see the look of dismay when we said, can we cut one in half? The exhibit has a sampling of Bond vehicles from throughout 007's movie career. This is the Lotus Esprit from The Spy Who Loved Me. And the thing you'll notice is that it hasn't got any wheels. It's got fins instead. It was an amphibious car and it went underwater. It also had a periscope in the roof so that Bond could actually see his adversaries when he was under the water. 
This is a BMW 750 from the film Tomorrow Never Dies, and it is the ultimate Bond gadget car. It has everything conceivable that you could want on it, including this magnificent row of rockets coming out of the sunroof, and a wonderful 20,000 volt defense system to deter any would-be car thief. Now, wouldn't we all like that on our cars? And it's also totally bulletproof. There's the BMW motorcycle from Tomorrow Never Dies. For our motorbike enthusiasts, we've got a motorbike in the collection here, a BMW jump bike. This was used in Tomorrow Never Dies in a very spectacular stunt in which Piers Brosnan, handcuffed to his accomplice Wei Lin, on the bike actually had to jump from the top of one skyscraper to another with the whirring blades of a helicopter underneath. I believe the, the uh, French stunt rider who actually did the stunt managed to do it in one take and I imagine he was very pleased about that. There's one of the original Aston Martin DB5s used in the Bond series. It is the epitome of an English gentleman's sports car. I think Aston Martin evokes a very romantic um, nostalgic feel. It's, it's a lovely name. If you think of sports cars, British sports cars, Aston Martin has to be the tops. And what else would Bond drive but the best and top British sports car? It's, it's just perfect. It's classic. It's not flashy. It's just beautiful. The driver's license used by James Bond is on display as is the winterized Aston Martin Vantage from The Living Daylights, which in the film could do a lot more than simply travel easily on snow and ice. It has some interesting features, like these retractable skis uh, for going on snow and ice, and spikes in the tires to give a little bit more purchase. It has many, many gadgets, all the controls being concealed in the armrest here, as in many of the other Bond cars. But one of the most lethal was a laser beam that emitted from the hubcap of the wheels, and in one very uh, memorable scene in the film, it actually sliced um, a police car in half and completely separated the top from the bottom of the chassis. Perhaps one of the most prized cars loaned to the museum from Eon's archive collection is the Rolls-Royce Phantom 3 from Goldfinger. For movie fans, this was a rare opportunity to see a famous film car that until recently had been kept under wraps. I'm sitting very, very carefully on the bumper of this beautiful Rolls-Royce Phantom 3 that was used in the film Goldfinger. We're absolutely delighted to have this car in the collection because for 35 years it's been in a private collection in America, so nobody's been able to see it. But two years ago, E.ON bought it back at auction in New York. It is the epitome of an English car and very different to the other cars in the exhibition here because it's not a racing or a sporty car. It's just sheer elegance and luxury. Bond had switched to BMWs for several of the films. But for the 20th Bond movie, he returns to a gadget-laden version of the Aston Martin V12 Vanquish. James Bond is now finally coming back and connecting with his roots. Aston Martin has appeared in various guises over the years with the, the 007 films. And now with the new V12, it's a perfect tie-in to the original first coming days of, of uh, James Bond. This 48-valve, 6-liter, 12-cylinder engine pushes a car that goes from 0 to 60 in 5 seconds. The car is as close to space age as any on the road today. We've also used some aerospace technology with a ceramic tile, which actually protects the engine from the heat that comes from the catalytic converter. If you look around as well, you'll see a lot of the heat shields here, and if you look down deep, you'll see plenty more. It's very similar to the aerospace technology that NASA uses with the space shuttle. The Vanquish, which is priced at somewhere around a quarter million dollars, is the perfect vehicle for 007 to take on the villains and make a quick getaway with the Bond girls. When we continue, a Virginia training facility takes aim in the real world of fighting spies. The famous ejector seat in the Aston Martin DB5 actually worked. 
and could throw a stuntman up to 40 feet. James Bond gadgets will return in a moment on Modern Marvels. On a trendy street in Beverly Hills, California, sits one of the country's most elite places to buy high-tech spy gadgets. It's called the Counter Spy Shop. Here, every conceivable form of spy technology is for sale. There are hidden cameras, listening devices, voice changers, everything a good spy needs. Employee Alex Sofer is an expert on counter espionage gadgets that can make the business of covert operations easier, whether a person is a spy or not. You can have this pager on you, in your pocket, it can be anywhere you want it to be. If you walk into a room environment first and you're the first to enter that room, this device will alert you if somebody else walks in this room wearing a wire or they're wearing a bug. This can help many a people out of many a jam. What we have over here is a unit that will bottom line let you know if your telephone has been tapped or bugged. This is a more sensitive unit used in larger situations such as film studios that have a concern that somebody might be trying to steal their secrets over the telephone. Many of the counter-spy gadgets have been used in major motion pictures this will also filter and modulate and give your to make the spy world of celluloid heroes more believable. These glasses were using the original Mission Impossible. What makes them not regular sunglasses is that there's a camera and transmitter built into these sunglasses. What I see and what I observe will be transmitted or recorded to a recording device. It's as simple as that. So what I see is what I'll be getting on film. What we have here is a technology that we patented many years ago, which is voice stress analysis. This is the CCS truth phone. This truth phone will basically allow a person to telephone somebody else, ask them a series of questions, and find out if they are lying. This wireless microphone is able to transmit up to 100 feet through walls to another location. Once transmitted to that location, this receiver over here will be taking in what is being transmitted. An example of something that is illegal in the United States is this pack of cigarettes right here. This would be considered a bug by the federal government or by the law. This is a covert piece of audio equipment, basically meaning that this is hidden. The audio transmission is hidden. It still works in the same manner. You'll be transmitting up to about 200 to 300 feet through the walls to this receiver over here. What we have here is a voice changer. This will alter a male or female's voice in 15 different settings. People will come in here, such as a female, she's getting some late phone calls at night, sometimes a weird voice coming down the phone. Well, she can all of a sudden become a very intimidating male that sounds like he's just got out of jail. As you should see, I'm to start to change my voice and alter it through this voice changer. This briefcase, basically, is the same theme as from Russia with Love. Somebody tries to grab this, they try to run away. What I would do right here is press this remote right over here and shock him from up to 200 feet away. 45,000 volts later, I don't believe this thief will be trying to run away with this briefcase. Fighting the forces of evil with gadgets on the big screen is an easy task. Trying to do it in the real world takes some practice. It's called Special Tactical Services in Virginia. Here, security companies, bodyguards, even Navy SEALs and elite Marine Commando units train. There's high-speed defensive and offensive driving techniques. And high-tech weapons training. Though several of the STS instructors are capable of doing many of the same things that James Bond does, none of them can do it all. For these teachers, that is the zone that lies between the fiction of a good novel or movie and the facts of life for spy professionals. For one guy to be able to do all those things at the greatest level he could ever do it at, it takes a great amount of maintenance. To be able to kick the crap out of anybody that comes along, okay, you better be training to kick the crap out of people. To be able to shoot any shot at a moment's notice from 10 inches to 10 yards to 10 miles, 
you better be training at it. To be able to drive a car, any car, any direction, in the water, under the water, over a cliff, whatever the case may be, you better be out there handling cars. One thing we do here is we don't have one guy that does it all. Even, you know, our, you know, people like to compare some people to James Bond because they do the neat things. They skydive or they dive or they, they were a SEAL or a Ranger or a CIA guy or whatever the case may be. When we train people here, we bring in the experts for that particular piece of the information. We don't have one guy teaching hostage rescue, driving, shooting, and every, every aspect of the thing, because no one that I know can do every one of those things to the degree of proficiency that you need to pass it on to other people. That pitch, that side pitch you just had, mm -hmm. that's what we're looking for. On an abandoned airstrip, they slam cars together at high speed, proving that vehicles behave differently in real life than they do in the movies. They teach how to cause another car to spin out without damaging their own. And students learn a series of maneuvers that may one day save their lives or the lives of the people they are hired to protect. In an isolated woods not far from the runway, a different and more lethal set of scenarios is played out. Here, the tactics used by spies and counter spies throughout the world are practiced in a scenario of hostage taking. One situation shows how a target in a car can safely be removed from a field of fire even if the driver is shot dead. The other driver is taught how to do high-speed maneuvers from the passenger seat. In a second situation when the driver of one car is shot, the driver of a second car is taught how to safely push the first vehicle to safety before the bad guys can finish the job. Classes at STS feature some of the most high-tech bond-like gear used in covert operations today, such as this thermal imaging scope, which finds a target not by sight, but by body heat. But it's always gonna fall back to the fundamentals. I don't care what kind of gadget you put on a gun, you still have to hold it steady, control the trigger, and have some kind of sight reference to be sure you're gonna hit the intended target. I know it for a fact. If you don't have a grasp on the fundamentals, you're not going to achieve any success. As spy films do their best to mimic the real world, it's getting harder and harder to come up with new ways to impress savvy movie audiences. But those who make the films will keep trying. The people behind the scenes, if they take something which they believe is something that can be seen on the screen and adapt it to whatever they want to do, and they absolutely love what they do because they're convinced that what they come up in their mind will entertain the people on the screen, and that's what their job is to do. They firmly believe in everything they do. They come up with an idea, they give it to the producers, it either works or it doesn't, and then we finally see it on the screen. Finding clever ways to meld the world of real spy technology with the magic of the movies has always been an art. It is a creative blend of skill and imagination, finding the best way to take high-tech gadgets and use them in fictional stories. This balancing act covers the gamut of thrills and dangers in the covert world. On the water, in the air, and on the road. The technology can at once save a spy from certain destruction and make a film a box office smash. It's a place where movies, magic, artistry, and action combine to create the best that fact and fiction have to offer. The amazing gadgets from the world of James Bond. The History Channel proudly offers the program you're watching on home video for only $24.95 plus shipping and handling. To order, call 1-800-708-1776 or shop online at historychannel.com. Weather in the air. As soon as your feet are off the ground, it's entirely different from anything you ever experienced. On the water. It was quite mean by that, actually. Or on land. People acknowledge it as the most famous car in the world. He wouldn't be himself without his James Bond gadgets. Only on Modern Marvels. Catch more Bond gadgets tomorrow at 10 on the History Channel.